Okay, so this is panel number two. What is and isn't working community perspectives. But after the conversation this morning, uh, something came to me and I wanted to read this quote by Malcolm X, which I think has a lot to do with what we're talking about here. Malcolm said, if you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six inches, that's no progress. If you pull it out all the way, that's not progress. Progress is healing the wound. So I just want to leave that, let that sit. I also want to say one thing before I move on and introduce myself, but I want to say one of the things that came up and comes up all the time is the diff this gets experienced in different ways. Many times it stays up here in our heads and reality is for folks of color, queer communities, all our communities that appear to be under siege from the beginning it seems we experience it down in here in our guts. And I think the more that we can all get it out of our heads and into our guts and understand that this stuff is killing all of us. And it reminds me of what you said. My oppression and my liberation is linked to your liberation. We are all in, in this together in that sense. Well, so with that said, as my name is Ken Alexander. I'll be the moderator for this panel. I'm a Northampton-based playwright and social activist whose personal work is grounded in the exploration of somatic body practices in order to explore the powerlessness, how powerlessness manifests in the male, black male body specifically. My consultant work uh, focuses on facilitating anti-racism and workplace culture, other workplace culture uh, and workshops and trainings. My clients include everything from Cooley Dickinson to Smith College Campus School, Great Falls Middle School, Hilltown Community Center, Earth Dance, PV Groves um, Network. I currently serve as the anti-racism consultant for communities that care of Franklin County and have been made the DEI, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion facilitator for the New Valley Creates program uh, that has spun out of the Community Foundation of Western Mass with a rather large bar foundation grant to look at inequity in how arts are funded throughout our area. With that said, the objective of this panel is to understand how communities of color perceive law enforcement and identify from our own perspectives the gaps and barriers that prevent better relations and explore possible opportunities towards building trust. With that said, I just want to introduce each speaker. I'm going to just do a sort of quick word about our quick sentence about each, and then I'm going to allow people to talk about the people. I also, when it comes time to questions, I want them from y'all. All right? All right. Oh, my, if you know me talk, I can talk all day. So, all right, yeah, that's it. All right, so I'm going to start with my far end. We have Nelson Roman, who has served as a Holyoke City Council representative in Ward 2 since 2015. Welcome, Nelson. Sitting after Nelson is Janai McDonald. She is a member of the Community Police Relations Steering Committee convened by the City Council President Orlando Ramos. And um, she'll talk more about who she is in the near moment. Then comes Yolanda Conciel, who is, has been a police officer and is now a community leader in her own community. And finally, last but not least, we have David Rutter, who chaired a committee convened by the League of Women Voters in Springfield examining civilian oversight. He's also the Associate Dean of the School of Professional and Continuing Studies at Springfield College. I welcome each of you, we welcome each of you, and I'd like to then perhaps start with Nelson. Let me do my hand. Nelson, you want to start just a little intro, short intro about yourself and your work and why you're here. Yeah, so thank you all so much for having me here. My name is Nelson Javier Roman. I was born in Waterbury, Connecticut. I'm not originally from Western Mass. I moved to Western Mass in uh, about 2008, 2009. Uh, for a lot of my children, this around the time. And then I actually ended up uh, HIV positive. 
homeless in the street. I did sex work, I did drug work, and I stood in a tent off of 391 in Holyoke for about two and a half years. Uh, and then I got out of that um, cycle of poverty, um, and then I started uh, doing community organizing work, specifically starting in the LGBTX community. Um, that's where I started my organizing work, and then I moved on to the Latinx community. Um, and so that's my, that's my base and my foundation. It's always been with the people, it's always been on the ground level, it's always been um, with those communities uh, that are most marginalized. And then in 2015, I got inspired because there was an open seat for city council. And I said, I'm going to go for it because I'm tired of BS politicians always talking about change and not affecting change. And so let's do it. Let's talk about racism, classism, homophobia, sexism, and let's really put policy behind it. So that's why I ran. I'm going to keep it short and simple. I apologize. I'm not feeling 100% today. But this is important to me to really talk about what is and isn't working and ways we can improve it. And I'm a storyteller. So I'm just going to share with you examples of what is and isn't working through real stories. These aren't bullshit. These aren't made up. This is what happened and hopefully it could be a, a continued aha moment. There was some stuff that stirred for me as a man of color sitting back there uh, that was down on my gut, but I'm excited to be here and honored. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Janae McDonald, and outside of being on the city of Springfield's Community Police Relations Steering Committee, I'm also a community activist. I'm a member of Western Massachusetts Neighbor to Neighbor, the Springfield chapter, and we work to address local, statewide, and national issues. Um, in particularly communities of color, mobilizing them, organizing them to really take um, control of their communities and create change outward from there. I'm also the mother of three children. I've come upon a decade of experience with the at-risk youth population in particular, and I'm currently a regional manager for a statewide nonprofit that services the underemployed um, and the underemployed and at-risk uh, population for not achieving um, certain success yet, basic education, Sustainable employment and self sufficiency. Thank you. Hello, my name is Yolanda Cancel. I grew up in Boston, off and on from Boston to Puerto Rico. Um, I became a police officer at 21. Um, then I got hired on the job around 23. I took a job in Hawaii uh, for juvenile detention. I did that until uh, 2015. Uh, no, uh, 2000. It was like 2005 or so. Um, I came, then I came to Springfield, um, where I got involved with, um, um, I started to see a culture uh, in Springfield that I didn't like when it came to law enforcement and uh, how our um, children were being treated. Um, I So I got more involved in that and uh, with Janae, uh, we, do a lot of different things with uh, neighbor to neighbor and different things. So I wear many hats. Um, and so I, I hope whatever question coming from a uh, being a law enforcement officer to now a civilian was a huge change. And I have grown an absolute lot um, within my journey. Thank you. <coughs> David Rudd, good afternoon, everybody. I am here. I chaired the Civilian Oversight Committee for the League of Women Voters, and I got involved due to the wonderful work of my wife telling me I should get involved. And it's been pretty awesome. Um, two of my members are over there to the left, Krista, and of course, you always you met the wonderful panel. You got a hard act to follow. The moderator is really good. I'm not involved. Okay, good. Just so you know. But um, got involved because over time I had become visibly sick and frustrated by the level of excessive violence I had seen on TV by police officers, predominantly to men and women of color. And there was no, no level of recourse where I thought was acceptable to me. And as a person who's highly educated, I always wonder about what life would be like if I got the wrong police officer at the wrong time when I tried to have a conversation and I was with my daughter and I'm having a hell of a bad day or something and then I happen to have a police officer who's having a bad day. I think about that a lot. It's a constant reality. And when we talk about issues of power that I think that we've talked about before, and I believe you brought that up, very much a reality in my world. Despite all my degrees, despite all the people who, re who report to me, in the day that I get pulled over by a cop, my anxiety level is very high. My heart races every time. I have never been in jail. And every time I hear a siren and someone comes past me, I wonder, 
why am I getting nervous? If you're an African American male, um, I don't know one person who hasn't felt that way. And that is why I got involved to talk about what we can do. And really my perspective as it relates to the civilian oversight is really thinking about how do we take an opportunity to where civilians can have a greater voice, but really educate civilians about what options exist out there across the country and really help people to understand they have a power and a voice, but the only way we can know that and what options we can take on is really understanding what evidence and what research is out there to support a direction and the path moving forward. So, thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, Dan. I'm going to start with Yolanda. Yolanda, as someone who has been, I'm sorry, but I, I, it's a perfect place to start. You've been both a police officer, and you're now a community leader. So from you have a unique perspective. And in your unique perspective and personal experience, what do you see as the biggest or the biggest challenges to better relationships between police and communities of color in your own experience? Um, I'm going to start off with, there was, when um, working the toughest areas of Boston, like Humboldt, um, Blue Hill Lab, um, around that, around those areas, um, I remember this one kid said to me, that blue will never save you from that red. And that, that resonated with me when I was a law enforcement officer. Um, the biggest, the it wasn't easy being a half black Latino woman in an Irish culture in the city of Boston. It was not easy. So when cops are saying all oh, these gang members and this no snitch mentality was exactly the same culture that I had to face if I had a problem as a law enforcement officer. If I didn't like what my partner did, if I didn't like the fact that he put on a handcuff from a kid that I knew, I had to deal with it. My lieutenant says, grow up. This is it. It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy watching my friends, um, kids that I grew up with, being arrested after handcuffs being put on them, still being mistreated, me standing there, um, me walking into a store while some white police officer shows this kid while walking into the store and I have to look at this kid's face and he's looking at me and I'm in the same uniform. I put my head down in shame because who am I choosing? Am I choosing this blue or am I choosing my, who I, my community? Things that I gotta come back to. One thing I can say, the officers who grew up in Dorchester, in Boston area, are a lot different from some officer who grew up in certain neighborhoods and then working in other neighborhoods. It was a huge difference on the way they treated the people that were there. Um, and it was hard. I mean, I was proud to be 21 years old with a lot of power and a gun. And I started to change. I started to see myself change as becoming a bigot. At 22, I started to see myself change because then my friends were my police force. I started to push back from my friends. I couldn't hang with them any longer. This is who I had to fit in. My new game was the law enforcement, the police department. I trained with them, I worked with them, I gotta get to know them. And that was a whole other level. And I started to see myself change little by little. Um, when I can say this, I am about to be 41. I am not the same person at 21. I feel that at 21 years old to give, I have a 23 year old, I couldn't even see him with a gun and a badge telling me what to do. So I feel that certain things need to change, especially if you're hiring someone straight out of high school. No college education, no psychology programs, no knowing the difference between this and that, to be able to say to someone and only give them a certain amount of training, lawyers go to school more, 
doctors go to school more, but we give somebody a badge and a hammer at 21 with a high school diploma. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. And it was a, it, when I got to Springfield and I started to see, I mean, Boston did it a little differently, and I see that the culture in Springfield was a lot different. I seen uh, a lot of Stockholm syndrome what residents felt they could take in and, and, and accept. For the first time in my life, the worst day in my life was to watch a Springfield police officer beat up both my sons. And for me to make a decision, am I gonna hop on this police officer to save my son? Or am I gonna just stand there and watch my sons get hit? It was the worst feeling in my life. I never in my life felt so helpless, so empty. And for this culture to consist and to say that this is what we should put up with. Um, in Boston, residents are always known to say, hey, we will you know, I felt like, I'm gonna go back to this as the saying on a cultural level. Not all blacks are the same. South and, blacks in the South are different. Blacks in, in, in Boston are different. All the way to here, they are different. Cultures are different. And putting everybody under that same box and to say, this is the way we're going to do this, and that's the same thing with law enforcement as the saying, you know, all cops are like this and Boston cops are different and Springfield cops are different. But what I do see is when you become a police officer, you're Latino, you're black, anything, you're just blue. And that's what I was, and that's what the culture that we started to raise. The worst thing was going into being a civilian. Um, I was a recent civilian in the city of Springfield. Um, actually, me and a police officer in this room had a very huge disagreement that we both grown and learned from. Was that it? No. <laughs> 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 Maybe you didn't grow as much as that. Brian has changed since the first day I met Brian. I remember this statement that resonated the whole room. He said, we're not all kissing babies. Boy, when he said that, the whole room was like, Black Lives Matter <laughs> to Brian. But when we had to grow. And when I say that, I believe in residency and people policing where they live is an important because this cowboy and Indian mentality to come into Springfield and say, hey, I've been watching all of this news. You already, when you come a police officer and you didn't grow up in Springfield and you're coming from Agrimal or one of the suburban neighborhoods and now you come into Springfield, you already have a preconceived notion on what you want to do. You're already treating them like they're part of whatever you went through. And that has to change. That mentality, it's, it's not, it's not what you're watching on the TV. It's not what you're seeing on 60 Minutes. That North End on the 60 Minute Review, come on. Who's walking around with eight RK 15s in the North End? Nobody. <coughs> but is there a high drug level? Yes. It's a high drug level everywhere. Would you guys want to call an epidemic now? Or crisis? Not in my neighborhoods. In Dorchester, we've been facing that for a long time. So now that you guys think it's a crisis because it's in the suburbs, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's been out. So people say, well, how are we going to handle it now? So, yeah, All right. that's Thank my you. Thing. Thank you. I pass it to Nelson because I want to ask you, Nelson, as a Holyoke City Councilor from Ward 2 for quite a few years now, what do you see as your role as we roll this out? Your role as City Councilor to ensure police accountability in your own community. And what are those challenges? Yeah, so again, number one, I just want to call the fact that my department isn't here. 
and I'm a little upset by that. And so I'm, I'm, I'm discouraged. Um, I, you know, the chief and I have had a few back and forth, and I have always voted to fully fund the department. So no one can come for me and say, as a city council, try to cut their budget. But as a city council, it's looking deep into the funding source. To say that in our holy public schools, this all is a peachy king, right? The fact that in our holy public schools, we arrested 30 young people, one young person as, old, as young as 11 years old got arrested during last school district year. And we spent $135,000 a year on resource officers that don't have a job description, that wear uniforms in the school. And when I was the chairman of the joint committee of the city council and school committee, I asked the chief, why are your officers in uniform? That's a CO mentality. My uncle was a CO. I get it. My cousins and my uncles and aunts are police officers in one grade. I get it. Oh, I make that decision. Well, you're automatically setting up to that mentality. So I asked, get rid of the uniforms. And just within this year, there's been two officers moved because whenever they go to a school, there's more excessive arrests that happen. And when I asked the chief in his face, chief, what happens if a student commits a crime in front of an officer or down the hall from the officer? Well, then we have to arrest them if it happens in front of our face. If it happens down the hall and the teacher stops it, they necessarily don't arrest them. We have a restorative justice program in our high school that's bar none, that struggles, that only needs $80,000 a year to succeed. If we spent that $135,000 a year on a system-wide restorative justice program that teaches self-governance, that teaches circle processes, that teaches sovereign logic to say, listen, when you go out into your community, you can handle yourselves, right? And that's what we're doing at Nueva. We got trained in a restorative justice facilitator, sign up being built from mass circles. You can look them up. There's tons of research on it that says self-governance is the platform and the bedrock of a community, right? And yes, also as a city council, I'm pushing residency requirements. When only 35% of our police force, fire department, and only 40% of our teaching staff are people from the community who live there, that's a huge problem. But when I talk about residency requirements, the police union doesn't want to back me. And it has to start with the administration. I hold this mayor accountable. That we need a civilian police uh, task force and a commission who oversee the police department. But it's all rooted in politics. When the mayor hires the police chief, and when right after a lot of these shootings and stuff happened, I personally reached out to the department and said, hey, we need to have a conversation. Because it's Black Lives Matter everywhere else, but in the city of Hollywood, the number one city per capita in the U.S. with Puerto Ricans, the Sheriff's Department gave me the statistic themselves. 77% of those coming out of incarceration are Latino men. Mm -hmm. We have to have those conversations. The police department said no notes and that's the national agenda. That was the quote. And with all due respect, when we were at, and I know I love Eddie, I'm a part of the, the, the task force, but at one meeting with Eddie, me and the chief went at it. And Eddie would have to be the peacemaker because Eddie's always the peacemaker between us. The chief got up there and said there's a national agenda that is not respecting our officers and our police officers. And they went off because we as a community are having those conversations. And again, I'm a storyteller. There has been massive shootings in Morgan. There was the, just the other day, there was a person who tried to jump into the school building, right? The community, the police department says, community doesn't call, community doesn't reach out, community isn't there. They called three times and it took a half hour for the first officer to respond. But when it's the end of the month that we know it's ticket time and we see that same officer driving around in circles, ticketing us, I have a problem with that. When we asked the police department to have those conversations, and we did a community meeting, Eddie was there, he was great, but we do, I don't call people from gangs gangs. They're tribal members. We have to get back to that indigenous culture. There's a tribal police, there are tribe members out there in the street, but why aren't we addressing the root cause of what forces people into the underground economy, right? And we're not talking about the fact that South Holyoke has an average annual income of 14,300, an unemployment rate of almost 25%, but what does the mayor and the administration and the police department say? Crime is down in Holyoke. It's the safest place to be according to FBI statistics. Holyoke is safe and that's bullshit. So unless we're really, and that's why I pushed from the city council perspective, to get a civilian data statistician position, someone who's gonna give us the real data of what's happening in these neighborhoods. Because all I keep seeing is that it's a repetitive cycle, but we're forming self-governance. So the association and us had a meeting at Morgan School, where the teachers, the parents, and even students were talking about the first time when the bullet went into their window. Halfway through, when we got to the tribal member, the Vanguard members do work with the tribes, and I as a counselor have talked to tribal leaders to say, hey, because that's the narrative. When the police control the narrative, the first thing they say is, hey, it was the gang members. Mm -hmm. We know the gang members are the tribal leaders from South Holyoke. Hey, is this your member? When two men got shot, we as the community did the peace vigil in March, right? And me as a city councilor, I get pissed every year when the police department operation full throttle puts a picture of every single person arrested in the city of Holyoke mm -hmm. throughout the year. And when I ask the DA's office, how many of those actually led to convictions, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 
That is the kind of policy shifts we need. And imagine if we had a society that really believed in circle restorative justice practices, that said, listen, I as an officer, I'm gonna refer you to whoever, I refer you to a diversionary program instead of locking up and putting that on your record. You can do restorative justice processes before you get into the system, right? That's the shift in the DA's office. We're pushing our DA, I'm pushing my DA to say, listen, before they even go to trial, have they gone to a restorative justice program? Have they gone to a circle process? Have they really been accountable to the community or sit in that community? But from a policy perspective, I try to put forward a civilian police commission in Holyoke. But we still face, and this Holyoke City Council, with 13 of us, only four of us are Latino in a city that's half, half Latino. And then the people always say, Nelson, it's because you guys don't come out of vote, this or that. It's not the case, so we're working on multiple fronts. But for me, it's all about the policy. I put forward a p civilian police commission. It's holding, listen, I said it, this new police chief that's coming in, Captain Feeble, love him. He's a Latino, he's from the neighborhood, but we need more of that. When I was growing up in Waterbury, Officer Riddick, I'll never forget him. He grew up in the neighborhood, he was my mom and dad's friend, and he lived in the neighborhood. And when he was off, the biggest thing we could start to do is put the shield down. Take off, be plain cold, be in jeans and a t-shirt, and come and talk with us. Officer Riddick on his off hours, when he saw the kids being knuckleheads, would say, hey, get back to your house or I'm gonna go home to your mother. Mm -hmm. Right? That is gone now. Like I said, when only 30% of the force live in Holyoke, and then they live up the hill. They don't live downtown, they don't live in the flats, they don't live in South Holyoke, so we struggle with that. And then the only programs we see are eddies. That's it. When the city's not investing in our kids, all we have is Eddie's example, right? And that's the sheriff's department, that's not our police department, right? We need genuine conversations, and we've tried to have that as a community. And then, like I said, midway when that tribal member was talking, the police department got up and left. We were doing community circles at tables like this, and the police chief refused to participate. Or the police officer sat in the back corner of the room and didn't partake. Or the state police officer who showed up with his privilege, white privilege and authority, said, oh, I'm here to speak first, I have to go, I have 20 minutes. I said, well, this is a community conversation, and you don't go first, the community goes first. And what we need to start doing is having those who are protecting us listen first because it's institutional trauma. Mm. I get goosebumps every time an officer passes me by, and I can tell you, in South Florida, I've been pulled over three times whenever I'm driving around in my nice black Nissan, and I have my fitted and my, my T-shirt on, I've gotten pulled over twice. And I asked the officer, because you know, in South Florida, it's kind of dark, and that's the city's investment too, right? We need to invest in our infrastructure. <laughs> what are you doing down here? I said, well, I'm the ED down the street, and my partner works at this school. The other officer approached the back of my car and is looking in my window. Now, if I didn't know, unless they had suspicion to be checking, I said, what is he doing? Why is he looking in my back seat of my car? Oh, well, you know, we've gotten some calls and reports of drug things. Well, just because I'm in a fitted in t-shirt doesn't mean I'm dealing drugs. I'm trying to go pick up my mom and my man. So please, let me go. They let me go, but that's the fear that we live in every day. So it's actual policy stuff. There's a lot going on. And I am grateful because, like I said, Eddie, I gotta give him credit. He's the mediator a lot of the times in Holyoke that allows us to listen. And on that platform, like I said, if, if it wasn't for him saying, oh, guys, let's talk about this calmly, me and the chief probably would have never gotten along. So we have to agree to disagree, me and the chief, a lot of the times. But creating more spaces where that can happen is what we need. And we need those in positions of power to just listen. If there was a whole day like this where marginalized people of color could come in, or marginalized folks who were in the system could just say what their experience is, mm -hmm. just listen, take notes. That's all I ask of the chief, just take notes. Go back to your department, and then you guys work within your system to see what you can do to dismantle it or change it, right? But there's no listening. It's always in a rush society. So um, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Nelson. <laughs> Since you have Mike, I want to ask you as a member of the Community Police Relations Steering Committee convened by City, by City Council President Ramos, what you share a, a kind of a different take on things, so I wondered if you could uh, unpack that. Sure, sure. Uh, so it actually, uh, the Community Police Relations Committee was actually convened um, over a year ago. Yolanda and I were both on that. And we conducted surveys, and after the report came out, we decided to condense. Um, and that's how we came down to the steering committee, and we decided to basically narrow it down to three main things that we wanted to do um, and change. And so the city of Springfield has a community police um, community policing model that it started out being, being implemented in high crime areas um, that are primarily communities of color as well. And I must say, I was one of the first ones to you know, be against it because I felt like you are over-policing communities of color. But what we found was that they, these police officers might have 
maybe um, participate in a little more sensitivity training. The interaction between the police officers and the young people was a little bit different. And if there was a call made or something happened in that neighborhood, there's a certain ease that came with knowing that Brian Bellavo, now lieutenant, back then he was sergeant, that if we saw him out the window, then maybe we thought things were you know, a little more okay. So what we would like to do is like to expand this model because there should be no difference between the police interaction when I'm pulled over or if I have a call, when I'm in a Mason Square area, which is a primarily black neighborhood, or whether I'm a black woman over in Ward 7, which is a primarily or affluent white neighborhood. Um, so that's the first thing. And we found that of other neighborhoods wanted that community policing model. And it gives us a chance to do something else very unique. It gives us a chance to reach young people, which is one of our other goals. We want to focus on recruitment for the Springfield Police Department and how do we recruit more participants of color. We can't do that if there's already the stigma of us versus them. We can't do that if our first interaction as a young person is, as Nelson said, an officer in uniform. And the difference between me having a bad day or maybe going through a rough patch with some stuff that's going on at home and the difference between me being sent to a guidance counselor or being arrested um, is going to change that path for a career path um, for many young people. And something that also is very interesting now, so we face um, somewhat similar issues in Springfield, is that there's an MOU between the school department and between the police department on how officers are placed in the school. Yet, there is no actual outline or there's no definition of what are considered, outside of what's regularly like breaking the law, like the student brings crack to school, you know, that's a reputable thing. Outside of things that are regular, you know, laws that we all have to follow, there's no clear outline on what is an arrestable offense. It is all left up to the, officer, the discretion of the officer. And so that is something that Neighbor to Neighbor, along with ACLU, has worked diligently on to kind of negotiate with the Springfield School Committee. But it's a blessing to be um, appointed to this committee because once I brought it to um, President Ramos' attention, that was something that definitely piqued his interest and it's something that they're going to look at addressing through the uh, Public Safety Subcommittee now. So that's another thing that's on our docket. Mm -hmm. Lastly is uh, looking at how someone can document a negative interaction with the police department that they have had. And making sure that we're educating people and understanding that you don't have to be hit over your head and slammed against the hood just to feel like you were disrespected, right? And just because maybe you drove off with just a warning doesn't mean that that interaction couldn't have gone more pleasantly. And sometimes we think that, you know, if things didn't happen to the full extreme, then I should just take my blessings and walk away. Um, but we need to let people know that if you felt like there was something unpleasant, you don't have to embellish things. You just, you know, you tell whatever it is that happened, however you feel. But there's some issues with that. Many eons ago, we used to be able to go to either the NAACP, the Urban League office, or some other community-based organization to not just pick up a complaint form, but to return it. And they would oversee that process. Mm -hmm. Now, not so much the same. So we're looking to reinstitute that, also as a, as a community police relations committee, kind of be a governing authority or an oversight committee to making these connections with community-based organizations, having them reinstitute that, so that we can have people that um, aren't afraid for lack of a better phrase, right? To file a complaint or file a compliment. Because as the form is now, the complaint and the compliment <coughs> are together. Those are two separate issues. That's the difference between me circling on the left and circling on the right. If you felt like you have a great uh, interaction with an officer or you felt like you went above and beyond to assist you or do something and you want to compliment that officer or the department as a whole, you deserve the right to do that. And the police department, the, the police department has a right to have that happen as well. I feel like too often, we um, create a lot of statistics around the negative, and let's frame some of the positive and figure out how we can merge those together. One more point before I pass off the microphone. Excuse me, I'm an aspiring politician. I ran for city council last year. So I'm a little longer. Here we go. Speaking of the Urban League, right, back in the 70s, the Urban League used to have a young cadet program. Mm -hmm. I graduated from a charter school, so I didn't have police officers in my school. I don't know what that feels like. Uh, my, my children, or my, my oldest son is in a charter school, my two youngest will be in a charter school. So I don't quite know what that feels like. I am simply, uh, you know, just going off of what I've learned, what I've observed, and based off the population that I have served. So back, circling back to the early league, back in the 70s, young cadets program. I went to National Guard training when I was in um, charter school. 
We went to a military base. We learned their drills. We learned their cadences. We propelled off the walls. You know, we learned, you know, right? That's really important. And if we continue to do that, we find ways to institute that in either all the public schools or just have a summer youth, young to death program. These are ways that we can channel young people into wanting to become a part of law enforcement, removing some of that negative stigma. And we'll also give law enforcement an opportunity to interact <laughs> on a positive note with some of these young people from communities of color that would have never in a million years thought of being in law enforcement. I can gladly say I have approximately six friends who I went to school with that did the National Guard training and they are now Springfield police officers and they are some of the best officers that I know. I, would, I had to trust them with my life long before they became officers. I would trust them with my life now. And I really think it's because they got that early exposure, that early interaction. They also happen, many of them, about half of them happen to have served our country and I think that also helps. And lastly, they are born and raised in the city of Springfield and that plays a major role. Who does not feel more safe, one, knowing that you have an officer that either lives on your street or in your neighborhood? And who better to understand the population that you're serving than someone that was born and raised in that area? Thank you. All right. And David, you chaired a committee convened by the League of Women Voters in Springfield here that examined civilian oversight mechanisms for police accountability in Springfield. So I'm going to ask you what these mechanisms look like, and based on your findings, what are the biggest gaps that currently exist? So the purpose of the report was to really, in a sense, when the committee got together, the legal notice, there were decisions that were being made by city council and by the mayor's office, which we did not really understand what was the context of what, how they got information, how they got data, and how was it assessed. We really didn't know. We, you know, so we wondered about law well, and the civilian oversight. And Gary, my colleague at Springfield College, every once in a while I go to his office to, um, to learn a couple things. And we talked, so the committee and I started to talk about why don't we just educate people of what civilian oversight is and what options exist throughout the country because we didn't know if it was one size that fits all. There's no one civilian oversight committee that looks the same from municipality to municipality. So we just wanted to say to residents, how can we share with you information that we think would be critical in understanding what civilian oversight could be? You don't necessarily have to accept the one that's currently being proposed by the mayor and be saying, like, we should be satisfied with that. Are there better options for us to advocate for? That was really the thinking and the catalyst that came behind that. And really about where communities and where we really strive to have a conversation was not necessarily to put a position out from where the League of Women Voters stood from, but really about what options existed to people and what the people in the city of Springfield had a stomach for. What level of oversight did you want? Did you want to oversight over the police commissioner? <coughs> did you want oversight over hiring and firing, you know, what, what is really in the best interest of the citizens of Springfield? Mm -hmm. And we didn't come from a position of what we thought that would be, but really wanted to have a dialogue about that. Because what we know of Springfield and the current police and department, there's some systemic issues in that. Uh, I believe everybody knows that we have a federal investigation that the Department of Justice is currently in, and which is huge under this current administration. <coughs> that they chose to come to Springfield when the Attorney General basically has said that we ain't going to do too much of that type of work right now. But the fact that they came to Springfield talks about some systemic issues that are going on that we're not even aware of. So part of it for us was to say that just, I think that just reverberated with us on the committee that speaks that we're on the right path. And one of the things we wanted to talk about and how, and how we really moved along was, for us, it was about transparency. There was a lack of transparency. And I believe there were a couple officers who were up for promotion. Despite having some gross misconduct, they were able to help me out. They scored enough on the civil service exam, which still made them eligible for promotion, despite a history of misconduct on their file. That is draconian. Numerous officers. Numerous. Not a couple. No, my fault. I, wow. I apologize. I don't it want to throw anybody under the bus. Let's get it. Straight. So, yeah, it so there were numerous. Terrible. So, it was a bad. So, for me, and I think for the committee members, we couldn't understand where anybody who had a job, who had some level of performance evaluation, has been. What's the word I want to say? 
I mean, it's hard to wrap your head around this. It's hard to wrap your head around people who have been written up, people who have been documented for misconduct, gross violations, and still be eligible for, mo for promotion. I don't know what job you have or anybody else have that that would even be a possibility. President. Right? So, so for us, and I'm not even going to touch that. So, uh, that's a whole other level, right? But for us, who are law-abiding citizens who pay taxes, and when we realized the misconduct of certain police officers, or numerous police officers, were resulted in civil lawsuits. Now we start to evaluate what's the return of our investment because our police officers who are having these level of misconduct are creating opportunities with people who have cases against the police department. And it is the taxpayers like myself who have to fit the bill. And that's a problem. It is a problem. Police officers, we thought from our position, this can't continue to work because the only thing it does, it creates a culture where there is no sense of accountability. Because if in a sense a police officer can be deemed of doing something inappropriate, still be eligible for promotion. When a civil lawsuit comes, it is the taxpayers who are covering the dollar of that. What is the incentive for change to take place? And from a standpoint where we thought about it, it's like these are the questions we need to think about from a civilian oversight perspective. Whether what it looks like or what are priorities for us, these are things that were important. Does that make sense? <laughs> right? So, yeah. No, well, I'm off. If you want me yeah, to. no, I'm okay. All right. So, you see, so, you no. give something more and get rid of the hatch. Right, right. So, <laughs> so, so, for us, and the more we delved into this work in the committee, we were talking about, well, what are we going to do with this information? And really, what it came for us was this is about job performance. I wish the lieutenant was here. I don't know how the lieutenant gets evaluated on how he does his job. What defines whether a lieutenant is successful in his or her job? I would like to know that as a civilian. I would like to know as a police officer, how are you evaluated every year on determining whether you are successful at your job? I know I got to do it. I know everybody on my team has to be evaluated every year. And they'll tell you two of my team members are here right now. I couldn't answer that question as a law-abiding citizen who pays taxes about how police officers are evaluated to do their job. I don't know what the metrics are. I don't know how it's of the discretion of their supervisors that determine that. There's a level of transparency that I think that needs to happen in order to change the culture. And I don't think police officers are inherently bad. I think it's the culture by which they work in with the lack of oversight and responsibility that creates that. And that's a problem for us. In the city of Springfield, I'll tell you, we also feel, that as we were doing this work, why is there a separate police academy for the city of Springfield? Why are they not part of the regional academy of training that all police officers that go through other municipalities? Why does the city of Springfield have something different? That in itself says that we want you to be different in the city of Springfield. That is problematic to somebody coming onto the workforce, right? So these are questions that come up for us, and these are questions that we want answers to. So from our perspective, I think, and I learned on Monday when we were at the state house, right? We learned in the state house, and I wrote this down. Um, because we believe in this thing called, this. there's only five states that are not, you know, you have a license to become certified to do your job as a police officer. Peace Officer Standards and Training, thank you my friends, called POST. Police Officer Standards and Training, I believe the DA spoke to this, in, not directly, but he said he has 53 law agencies that report to you, right? You have 53, why there's not a level of commonality of how they operate and how they're evaluated? I think he said it very, that's a hard task, but we can streamline the expectation of how people are evaluated who are police officers in whatever municipality that they are. That level of consistency has to take place. It shouldn't be so vastly different from Springfield to Chicopee to Holyoke. There should be a level of consistency and expectation in how you evaluate people in their job performance. So one of the things we've talked about, and it's been a discussion, is the process of how we move Massachusetts and not think about that. So somebody, and we learned this on Monday, which was wonderful, scary at the same time, is that somebody could resign from a position, not get terminated, they could be resigned from a position, their gross misconduct is not even identified, and they could go and take a job in another municipality and continue. That's crazy. A financial planner couldn't do that. A lawyer couldn't do that. A teacher couldn't do that. 
Why would we accept that for people who we give guns to, who have the right to seize you, who are right to arrest? Why would we give this level of freedom? That is beyond our level of comprehension why that still takes place. I think what we're simply saying as a league is saying like, there are standards and expectations that we think everybody has to abide by. And once we continue to not to allow police enforcement or um, police officers to follow that same level of expectation, then we are inherently creating a bias in the system. And that is problematic for all people. Because absolute power will always corrupt. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. So, with that said, thank you. Thank you to you. I'd like to open it up now, because I hear stomachs growling. But I want to have a true Q&A. I think we have some wonderful things bubbling up. So, Malaki, let me have a hand up. And you can address the panel or to individual people. Hi, I just wanted to... Um Oh, I'm sorry. Your name? Uh, my name is Maureen. Um, I come at, I'm come. i here at this panel both as um, someone on the advisory board with Critical Connections, but also I work in the field of human trafficking and um, also urban security, which takes a holistic look at real and perceived um, safety and security in urban areas um, that takes a human rights approach as opposed to a, you know, uh, a surveillance approach and uh, based on a model in a European model that's been very successful, of which law enforcement is a really critical and positive component. I just want to go back to Mr. Hall's um, wonderful, uh, <laughs> he has a term now that I think will not leave me, which was um, about liberal exceptionalism. Um, prior to Izzy and um, Mr. Rome, I'm a resident, Irish Catholic, born and raised here. Um, uh, prior to them speaking, I actually called the city because I'm embarrassed that there's nobody from from law, political law enforcement here. Um, and frankly, I put this at the, at the feet of, and I probably will get criticized for this, at the mayor, who, um, you know, hired internally and did not, there is not an external chief of police and a culture of indifference has been allowed to thrive and um, all under an administration that is quote unquote liberal and exceptional. And um, I, what this, um, you know, I just want to thank, um, Nelson, I didn't know who you, who you were, I'm in a different board and I just want to thank you for your hard and honest work. Um, and to just say we need to be careful about labeling people politically. And um, my eyes have been opened up. There's some wonderful panelists here who I don't know what their political persuasion is. They're just plain spoken, decent human beings trying to do the right thing. And, um, and I am embarrassed that there's nobody here from the city of Holyoke. But it's a, that indifference has been allowed to thrive. And that's all I have. Thank you. Next. Hi, uh, my name is Stephen. I'm from the United States Attorney's Office in Springfield, part of the United States Department of Justice. There's actually several people from my office here listening. I want to thank you for all of your thoughts. The question that I had was for prosecutors like myself and my colleague who's here, what uh, suggestions would you give to us as we evaluate cases? I know it's a fairly broad question, but I'm wondering, from each of your perspectives, what thoughts you would give to us, being mindful of the fact that often we don't um, ever meet in any meaningful way the defendants that we are prosecuting. And keep in mind, too, that many of the defendants that we're prosecuting, but not all, are uh, people of color. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have no response. Good question, thank you. Um, I want to start off by saying that someone's resume does not define their character. Um, and I take that as a law enforcement officer. I think that as a prosecutor, what you're reading on your incident reports, I feel that as a prosecution, what I do see going on in the courts is that once once a report has gone through, the prosecution is reading it, and it's reading as if it happened right then and there. You guys weren't there. So why should you just believe every single police officer who writes a police report? 
I think that just like anything, if a police officer makes a report, I feel like you should show up to court. Read your own report. I don't think that the prosecution should just say, okay, I'm gonna, this police officer made this arrest, I arrested Janae, now Janae has to face you guys. You're reading her police report, but she's not stating, she has to talk to her lawyer to, to, to define her, so she's already guilty before she's innocent. It's not the other way around. So I don't agree with that. I feel like if there's a case that went through, the police officers should be there. Because obviously it's between that. The prosecution, I think, takes on this this sense. And then they're reading the police report and the judge is taking, okay, this is what you did. Now I'm going to find you for what is written on this incident report. As a person who was 21 uh, and a police officer, I've seen a lot of lies on incident reports, especially if a cops was put on um, yeah, the Mariner warnings weren't read or anything like that. I've seen BS, especially if you're writing the incident report, you're taking it back to the lieutenant, doesn't sound good. Not, that's not going to pass in court. Write, write something that's going to make it stick. Mm -hmm. But you prosecutors don't know that. My incident report has to be read by my, by my superior and, I ha and it has to stick. So the only thing that, the, the time's not true, that's why when you first write the incident report, you write at approximately da 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 time and date. That's it. But it's my opinion. If there's, a, if there's an accident going on right now, we all have differences of opinion about what happened. So I think that the prosecution needs to change the way they handle that and, what, and how you read that police report and how judges perceive what is read on that police report when it comes to that. Thank you. I think Nelson wants to add. I have a quick question. I'll be a politician and answer a question with a question. But I really want to know, um, why is there not time or why are you not able to meet with the defendant? Uh, is it time? Is it staffing? Why not? Because I feel like that's very crucial to the process. So, okay, that, that is a great question. I can answer it. it the reason is to protect the defendant. So when a defendant has been arrested, among the first thing that happened is this defendant goes to court and is appointed a lawyer, and that lawyer stands as a shield between the defendant and the prosecutor. So there are opportunities, at least in the federal system, for us to meet with defendants, and we do do that, but not in every case. Uh, I can't speak to the state system, but usually, we are not interacting with the defendant because he or she has a lawyer who represents that defendant on the client's behalf. And if the lawyers usually, if you're talking about communities of color, I hate to say, but they're probably court appointed or uh, they, they and um, work under a strained budget and limited so time frame. In the federal system, people of any race who are indigent are appointed counsel, but I should say that those counsel are excellent. Um, they are often better counsel than I could afford if I were in trouble. So I just wanted to add, because you're asking like, what can we do from a you know, prosecutorial perspective or anyone, state level, federal level. I know that we have started to reduce mandatory minimums, but I think that when you're looking as a prosecutor, nine times out of 10, you're right, you're from the same neighborhoods, the same communities, the same places. What is the alternative to minimum sentencing, or what is the alternative to sending them into the, with all due respect to any of the, everyone from the Sheriff's Department, into that system? Is there the Nuevas of the world? Is there those other organizations that do restorative justice model work that's genuine, that doesn't continue to perpetuate into that system? Where is the alternative to the prison system? Um, and just, I wanted to kind of touch back to your point, because it kind of goes to everything. The whole system in the hood, right, because I speak from the hood because that's where I come from, hasn't changed. And I, you know, I heard Eddie say it politically, you know, we have this president. Nothing changed from Bush 1, Clinton, Obama, and now this president. So in the hood of South Philadelphia and the Flats, or where I'm from or grew up, nothing has changed. It has always been the same, whether you have that progressive mindset or not. Um, we in Holyoke have those, you know, sentence enhancing zones that I'm trying to get rid of locally. Why do we have those? when most of the population of color is always concentrated around the school and the cities. So we're gonna arrest them, have those minimums because it's a sentencing enhancing zone. That's something we need to get rid of from a policy perspective. But from you, when you're prosecuting, you don't see them, you don't get to meet them before sending them there, or even to that, they need to go back to their own community. 
So we need to have those restorative justice principles. And I say that to the state district attorney, to you all, the federal one, where is this community model, exactly what Izzy's saying, where we take that person and hold them accountable for their actions? Where they have to come back to us as a community and say, how are we gonna be productive? And I only share this with this. Being someone who did sex work and drug work, clearly I was locked up a few times in my life. I don't hide that or sugarcoat that for anyone. I now know that system, so when anyone gets arrested in the hood, they know to come to Nelson and Guayma. We give them community service hours ahead of time. We let them do work in our community right away. And one of the examples of one of our artists in residence, he got caught burning a dumpster because the landlord kept putting the dumpster not changing out in front of the artwork that he did, so he lit it on fire. He's been doing community service work, and now the state DA let him go because we've done the community service <coughs> ahead of time. So he didn't even have to go into the system at all. We were pre, pro, you know, proactive. He did all the community service work. He's been in the community giving back, teaching kids, and didn't even get to hit the system at all. So I think that those are the kinds of things that you all should look at. Say, hey, we're in our district, our census, and there are, there's multiple other organizations in Massachusetts doing this work that you can say, hey, we're gonna send them there and not put them in the system at all. Because it's the difference between that record or not. And so I would just go from there, um, and I would just as a suggestion, look into those things. Thank you, Nelson. Next question, anyone? Ah, I see a hand raising up here. Oh, inching up, all right. Um, hi, my name is Trenton Lawson. Um, thank you all for sharing so much um, knowledge and uh, passion. I really appreciate you all. Um, my question really is around uh, the school resource officers in the schools. Um, I have the opportunity to be a social justice educator throughout Western Mass and Connecticut. And one of the things that young people are always bringing up is the role of this position. So I'm wondering if y'all can speak to, right, in what ways is this directly contributing to the school to prison pipeline? Um, and what ways might be improve or change, right, that position to actually be more beneficial for our communities? Thank you. So I grew up clearly in the world after 9-11. I remember when it happened in high school. I remember the very next month we had school resource officers in the city of Waterbury. The difference was, again, because I've traveled different communities, exactly what you're saying. The school resource officers for the city of Waterbury aren't active police members. They're hired by the district. They're required to go through trainings of de-escalation. They are accountable to the district and the staff there. They're all plain clothed. But a lot of them were retired state officers or local officers or just folks who want to go in there. The difference, and I can only speak to the city of Holyoke, is like I said, we don't even have a job description for that individual. We don't have a method for employment. So literally, it's all on the you know the hierarchy of the police department. You want that job, it's, and, and it counts for overtime, because you still can have that job, and then they'll put you on an assignment, so it's, it's more money. So specifically for Holyoke, what I'm trying to change in the system is that there is a job description, and that the schools, we don't even have an MOU in Holyoke with our police department and the schools, the system. So at least they have an MOU that you can look at and say, here, here's the metrics. We don't have that in the city of Holyoke. And I think finally, we as a community need to come, and again, I'm gonna say this, it might not be popular. We need to come when it comes to criminal justice system in the world, of, of a method of how do we dismantle. Either we're in restorative justice models and principles, or we're in incarceration principles. So for me, I don't want any police officers in the school whatsoever, because I grew up in a system where, yeah, you get suspended, and your mom was handling you the minute you got home. But now, I act up, and I'm getting locked up. The fact that in work and school, they created a 12-year-old from one end of the building to the other is the problem for me. So I'm pushing the district and the city, and again, it goes back, I laid at the feet of this administration. The mayor and whoever's leading your community needs to say, I don't believe in this principle. We need to give that back to the schools. Do I think that there should be support? And, and, and even right now, for those schools that don't have an officer, those resource rooms that they put the bad kids in, it's not an acceptable principle or model. We have to do this restorative justice model, where the kids, both, both individuals, those affected and, and who are affecting, get their voice heard. And it takes time, it takes a culture change. And I think a big problem that we're having in marginalized communities is that ancient Greek philosophy, know thyself. If I'm a man of color, and Eddie said it earlier, yes, 50% of men, their parents are locked up, or dads are locked up, but when is, when, when is law enforcement or the justice system saying we're the fault for that? We're the ones that made that culture. Mm -hmm. And the reason why you don't, and you're getting locked up at a higher rate is because your father, right, who was locked up, couldn't pass down that generational knowledge to you, mm -hmm. right? Couldn't teach you the ways of being a man of color on the street, or watching out, or showing that respect. Mm -hmm. But we have to have that coming to Jesus moment, where the schools start teaching culture. For example, the Holy Police Department, and we're talking about things that go right as well, 
I do have to applaud the, the current chief and the previous chief. They're allowing Nueva to come in to work with them to train officers on LGBTX issues to ensure that trans women, if you identify as a woman at whatever case, that female officer still has to show up, regardless of you know your birth. But you, that female officer still needs to show up to support that individual who's getting you know locked up for whatever they did. One, two, religious differences. I practice the non-trivial Christian belief of Ifa. Yes, we do animalistic sacrifices, and Holyoke's finally, there's a lot, we're like, you know, we do that, okay? But the police department is finally allowing us to do a sensitivity training to say, what happens when you get a call to say, hey, they're doing stuff with roosters and chickens. It was actually Supreme Court justice ruling that said that we could do that as part of our religious practice base. So those little nuances, including with this police department, I really do have to applaud the chief because we're as a community finally saying, get out of the school systems completely, and then focus on supporting that restorative justice program. So that's what I would recommend. Thank you, Nelson. We have time for one more question. Oh, two or three. Oh, two or three. Oh, two or three. Uh, excellent. There's a gentleman here with his hand up in the back there. I may not need this mic. All right. He just hold it for looks. Yeah, just hold it. I was sitting here and it was. You know, I, I wanted to say something inside saying don't say anything, but I have to. Um, I work for Roca, and what Roca is, Nelson, I'm not sure if you do know of Roca, but Roca is now, we have a, we're going to have an office opening up in Holyoke, and we deal with high-risk young men, and we also deal with young moms. So we work tirelessly at trying to disturb that cycle. Um, I am suited for the for what I do because I was that person before. So I don't have the masters, I don't have the bachelors, but I have the life experience. And we have a mix of people that come together that have the education part and then the experience part. So those things work together. And if not knowing me, not knowing me, and you just see me sit around. I wear hat, I wear baseball hats much like you. I drive, I drive my car, I, I enjoy nice things, you know, and I have that look. So do I get pulled over? I used to get pulled over a lot before because of what I used to do. But I, I had to I had to make a decision change after doing my incarceration. And because of my decision making, I got different results. But I'm not, I, it's not all the ways to say I'm treated because I'm not. I don't get no free passes by anyone, and I don't look for anything. I work hard. The way I worked in the streets when I was doing illegal things, I worked hard. So I have to work even harder now because I'm trying to do all the right things. I am thankful for God opening doors for me and for me being accepted because it allows everyone else, law enforcement and everyone else that may have never broke the law, to see that there is change for everyone and everybody. Because that's, the, that's what we need. We need everybody to look at everybody differently. In our program, there are some people that see the bad in people, but we always look to see the good. And when you have that mindset of just coming in and trying to open up, because I was, I was um, treated bad by the police. I was treated bad. Um, stepped on, kicked, handcuffed, beat up, uh, thrown down the stairs, trying to break shoulders, how, everything. But I had to get to the point where I was like, you know what? If I hold on to all that, I'm going to not be effective enough with helping those that I'm working with. So for me, I had to say, you know what? Those experiences, I have to take and say, I don't want you to have to go through that. So I have to build relationships with the officers, with everyone else, so their future won't have to be that role that I had. So, uh, thank you. So, uh, do you have a question for anybody up here, though, or I no, didn't mean to cut no, you off? No, I'm sorry. I'm okay. sorry. It's I, all don't, right. I don't have a question. Don't need to be I sorry. Just, I just wanted thank to you. share. So, yeah. no, that. I appreciate sharing, you sharing that. But in the same vein, I also want to say that expectations of you should not have had to endure some of the things you did on the front end as well. 
And where do we talk about that level of responsibility and accountability, right? It's a two-way street. I know many times we've been talking here about this mutual respect thing, which I'm a little challenged by, because I'm like, when you say mutual respect, I'm, if I'm a trained police officer, there's a level of expectation how you are supposed to operate, right? Within your job performance, within how you're evaluated your job. As a citizen, if you put yourself in a bad situation, like I said, anybody having a, a bad day on a given time and you meet up with somebody, something can happen. But the question is, where do we say the expectation of people who are trained to arrest, seizure, shoot, if they feel harm? Where is the level of expectation we have for those types of professions? You can't be a doctor and keep killing people and still think you're going to have your MD degree. You can't be a lawyer and continue to have malpractice and still think you're going to have your law degree. Why should we not have the same level of expectation of people who are in the police force? That's just reasonable. That's what, that's, that's what a civil society would do. And the fact that we do not continue to, to elevate the expectation of that is problematic for us because we can't talk about real change unless we're saying that the playing field has to be equal in what we have the expectation for anybody. And I just think that's a reasonable thing. So as you talk about change as, and, and forgiveness, which is absolutely part of the model which we have to do, doesn't excuse the fact that we still can't have accountability at a level and have a great expectation that we all should be treated in a particular way. Nelson, I believe, has something to add. I just wanted to, again, add to that comment two things. One is, again, I'm a storyteller. So one time, me and my friends in Waterbury, Connecticut, did a drag show for charity. It was the first drag show I've ever done. And yes, my happy fat butt got in drag. And the police shut us down, and they sat me in the middle and said, what the hell are you? You're disgusting. You're nothing, right? Every time I go to Waterbury, from similar to Izzy, I still see that police officer. So for every one success story or someone who's able to, in their own sovereign logic, either compartmentalize or heal or move on, there are 10 more who have that institutional trauma who cannot move on. So we have to get to a point where I can sit with that officer and he can hear how he demeaned me how he made me feel less than, how he made me feel distant from my human connection to the world, mm -hmm. and that they received that. I'm not saying I need to change them, but unless Izzy is able to get that out, how do we ever start to, as humans, connect to hear that I could affect you in a way that's different? And I do know Roca. They were gonna move into Nueva, but the biggest difference was that sovereign logic. When I sat down with the, the, the executive director, and what I was told was, well, you know we operate in the system, right? And I said, well, you know I hold the system accountable and I'm trying to dismantle it. So it's a culture difference. So I do know Roca very well, and we're doing the same circle process. Saira Pinto, who invented that for Roca, is the same teacher who's teaching us that we gotta get back to our indigenous roots, right? We gotta get back to the three principles of circle, which is, one, seeing the beauty in everything, right? Two, it's feeling the warm embrace of community. And three, it's lifting each other up when we're broken because we are a broken community. Mm -hmm. But if I cannot get that out to my fellow human being just because, and this is where I'm talking about we have to lay down our guards. Because yes, when I go into community meetings, nine times out of 10, there is the shield. There's the shirt and the tie and the suit and the, and then the community is like, whoa, 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 we've already set up that different, that other, and what we're trying to be in circle just come as right. That's why I do give credit to Eddie. I know he's dressed up real fly tonight, but usually I'm used to Eddie in jeans and a polo. Like that's where Eddie, I, we're talking about what works, they feel like they can come up to him. Versus, like I said, that school model where the, the, the officer's always in a uniform, and if, uh, the student, and that's what Balante does, we're holding the officers accountable in the schools. Even if that officer arrested you, that child's still gonna have to go in every day and say, that officer pinned me down. And that rage, that anger. So for every one person who has that capacity, that sovereign logic to do it, but for, us, for years, it's still to this day, when I see that person, my blood boils. I wanna say, you hurt me. But I can't, because I'm fearful that it'll be a back and forth exchange, and that it's gonna lead to something else. So I just want us to know that we have to get to that point where we have to have a more, and that's why I'm excited for the groups, the small groups this afternoon, we have to get to a point where exactly what we're doing today, law enforcement, the justice system, and those impacted and affected could be at the circle to share what they were really going through. Because they have to, what we call it Spanish desarrollar. I'm not sure how to translate that in English. It's like basically get it off your chest kind of way to help you evolve as a human being. Unless you get that out, it's gonna sit and fester to some, or some can move on from it. Another great example of that, we, in our circle process, we train 25 community circle leaders, and we're gonna to continue to be training circle process leaders, because that's the way of the future. One of our circle members struggled because they were in the DCF system, they were you know, raped, molested, blah, 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 and sometimes, even by the same you know, law enforcement agents, because he was a black man, held down. 
he still struggles on a day-to-day -day basis when he just passes a police officer. And he's very outspoken and verbose, but with the circle process, it allows you to sit and listen, to just really reflect and say, listen, I can only be accountable to me, like you just said. In your sovereign logic, you're accountable for your feelings, your actions, but I, it's not my job to tell Mechlatha how to feel. It's not my job to say, hey, because I'm able to be here and express myself now because I moved up the privilege ladder a little bit. So as a counselor, as an elected person, I know I got more privilege than my guys in the hood that I used to buy from and sell from, right? And I'm one of, probably one of the only few city councilors who's publicly said, I'm a bike, and I still, they always look at me, they gasp. Yes, that I buy weed still from the hood, and I use marijuana recreationally because I have HIV and I need it. And guess what, these medicinal dispensaries that we've now legalized for white people still is not affordable for me. So my 40 ounce in the street is cheaper than this place is. My colleagues look at me like I'm crazy. I say, I need to share that because that's a real experience for people in the hood. And although we've decriminalized marijuana in Massachusetts, we still haven't gotten to a space where as a restorative justice package, we're completely, and yes, we've expunged some now with this legislature, but we've also increased mandatory minimums in other places. So they just did it, thank God, and rest in peace, Jafet. We've been able to change some of that, but we still have a long way to go. So I just want to share that with you, and I appreciate you sharing your, your, your piece, and also acknowledging that there's still those who need that restorative justice component because they haven't come to that piece. All right, Yolanda, you want to add? Thank you, Nelson. I just wanted to add something really quickly. Um, I'm gonna say police and unions. I'll say it again. <laughs> police, and unions. police and unions. I'm not running for office, so I don't care what union, you ain't gotta vote for me. <laughs> Today I can't say anything about unions, but I will. The Patrolman's Union is one of the strongest unions, right? Politically, and all the dues that they pay in and everything else. What I don't agree with is the sense of the union is to help the employer maintain their job, their insurance, their integrity, and make sure that they're in a, a warm and health, health and, and, and get their, their working hours and everything else. That is union. I don't feel that any union, not from the teachers union, not from the law enforcement union, if an individual harms the public in any form, I don't feel that they should be represented by their union. I feel that they should stand. They should hire their lawyer. Because the union is to represent the individual. The second that individual harms the public in some form or way, I don't feel that the union, and this is gonna be hard, I say it starts with a conversation and hopefully ends with a solution. And I think each of you <coughs> think about that as a character. I've seen lots of law enforcement officers, lots of people who had the union, did something wrong and has a union defending them and they're going back to work. That's hence what you said about individuals, 12, you said, 12 law enforcement officers just recently too, and then they have the unions defending them. It's not right. <laughs> and as much as each of you might feel that, I feel that that should be a change in that culture. That's the reason why I speak on the prosecutors when they're reading this police officer's incident report by verbatim like it's the Bible. Like it's true. And um, so I just wanted to touch on that. Um, I also wanted to make sure that um, I touch on the fact that in, in our South End, in our area, no, or just in Springfield in general, our kids, our young adults, our families go through a lot. And I am so proud of Brian for what he has said because I am so happy that he's a lieutenant for our area. Because if there's more law enforcement that have that, there's a difference between sympathy and empathy. But somewhere he has found himself to look at the culture in a different way. And if we can get more law enforcement, more the C3 model is to have the community, the police, and everyone in between to help us, to help e 
each and individual. And at first, I didn't care for the C3 because I thought that it was this thing for gentrification. I've seen it in the south end of Boston. You can't even move back into the south end of Boston unless you have a million dollars. And I felt like that's what the south end of Springfield's gonna happen. Nobody can afford it. They're getting pushed out. Greenfield's about the face. Three Rivers, they're moving everybody out of Springfield. You can't afford to live here. If you don't fit our model, you won't live here. And I felt that that is a problem. So I, got, I want you to look at it, and I don't feel that politics should be involved in law enforcement, but it does. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, I'd like to thank you all for your attention, for your questions, for your presence. And again, I'd like to try and ask folks to get it out of here and bring it down into here to what you're feeling. And I think uh, you were asked at lunchtime when you're eating your delicious lunch, maybe sit down and talk to someone that you haven't spoken to. Try to open up your minds and to sit with the fact that you're dealing with wounded communities and that wound needs to be healed in a way that is healthy and holistic. And with that, we just had a round of applause for all